everyone, I'm your host, Heather Ashley, and welcome to another episode of Women of Her Story, a podcast dedicated to celebrating women who have made or are making their mark on our society. Today, I have with me New York Assemblywoman, Carmen De La Rosa. Thank you so much for joining us today, Carmen. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. How's your day going so far? So far, so good. Um, I'm in the office. We've been working through this pandemic, and um, today was kind of a slow day, so I was happy about that. Um, Just helping out and doing what we have to do at the office. Awesome. I hope this is a nice little break for you. (laughs) Yes, this is different. I like it. (laughs) So tell us about your background. What inspired you to get into politics? Yeah, so I'm an immigrant. I was born in the Dominican Republic, and I immigrated to this country um, with my parents when I was a child. Um, And my parents really made community like the center of our lives as I was growing up. I remember like being part of a youth group, um, helping other students in the community with tutoring. I was one of the only um, people who in my building spoke English, so helping people fill out the census. So I got that little bug of being community oriented and being really involved in the things that were happening in my community. I kind of felt like it was a responsibility. Mm -hmm. So after I graduated college, I was debating law school or going into public service. I walked into a law firm and I was like, this is not the environment for me. Like it was too (laughs) thorough, um, too uptight, no offense to our lawyers out there. Um, but I was like, I need to do something that is more community grounded, more of what I felt comfortable doing. And so I went and I interviewed for an assembly member's office to be his scheduler. Um, and that started me off in my career in politics, doing scheduling um, for, for an assembly member who is now my colleague in the assembly. Um, and so I started there and I got really to know what government was like. Um, and the things that I could actually impart from my experience. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, I decided to run for office. Um, And I was lucky enough that with all the work that we were able to put in, not an easy journey at all, but I was able to be elected in my first round. And not only was I elected, but I um, I unseated an incumbent at that time. And that was the night that we also elected President Trump. So it was a different dynamic than what I was expecting, uh, but it really um, began a career of having to advocate and having to stand up for the rights of the community that I had just been elected to represent. Hmm. So why, why is it so important to get out and vote and not just in the big elections, but the local ones too, like for, for assembly members, for, for local representatives? Absolutely. Well, first, I like to think of voting as a muscle. If you don't work out a muscle, you're never going to build strength. So voting in local elections allows you, one, to develop that muscle, to learn the process, to see the parts of where you can engage in discussions that are happening during local elections. For example, here in New York City, the local city council, there are 51 members of the city council. That Those people, the representatives that we elect there, are the people who negotiate with city hall and with the mayor about all the services, all the goods, everything that's happening in each of our blocks, in each of our neighborhoods. Mm. On the state level, we have the same task, but we negotiate with the governor of the state. And so in local elections, really the things that are happening to you on a day-to-day basis, whether you have sanitation services, whether you have access to public health options, whether you have access to education and what that education looks like, that is all decided on a local level. When you Mm -hmm. get to the federal level, you're deciding the bigger picture policies, like for example, immigration for the entire country. Mm -hmm. But on a local level, you're really deciding like the quality of life issues in your own community. So who gets elected and what are the services that comes into your community are tied. Um, And so that's why it's important for us to one, develop that muscle, but two, The issues that affect your day-to-day will most likely be decided by these local representatives. Mm -hmm. And if we go out and vote for them, we'll be in in tune with what the issues are that they, what they stand for and what it is that we're trying to get them to go and advocate for us to do. Mm. And then it's kind of like a domino effect because then these, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I feel like we're not really taught in school 
to vote on a local level. We, I know my whole life, all I thought about, all I thought voting encompassed was during major elections. And that yeah. could be just like naivete as a child, but like, I feel like if we're educated properly in these like government classes that we are all taking in high school, they're not, these, these issues aren't being addressed. I remember being a senior in high school and I turned 18 on election day. Mm. And um, so I got to vote and I was so excited, but then I never even thought about being able to vote on a local level at that point. Cause it just wasn't, information that was readily provided yeah and that's like what civics is about right mm -hmm. making sure that students are not only learning about what's happening in the world but how to apply that to the community that you live in because there's many issues right here in our backyards mm -hmm. that we should be having decision over yeah. um and so that's super that's a super important part of the education curriculum that i think needs to be encouraged especially at this time but we have so much going on, mm. global pandemic, national uprisings against racism. Um, it's a time for us to really um, help students to develop that muscle of, advoc of mm. advocacy and social justice. You know, what's funny though, I feel like social media has helped that a little bit in a way. Have you noticed like the, this, what are they, Gen Z? I don't know, right? They're the ones right after millennials. I think so something yeah. like that i don't yeah, know yeah, but yeah. <laughs> they're like all over tiktok doing Absolutely. all kinds of things so i hopefully there's a shift in the tide for yeah. information and become all a that. trend yeah it's <laughs> yeah. kind of become a trend to be politically active well what we hope though is that that trend continues on mm -hmm. and that these are lessons that young people like us are um taking responsibility and ownership over Absolutely. for generations to come right that not that it's a fad that it's cool right now to <laughs> go out and advocate but then we forget about it when the next cool thing comes around right right absolutely well you mentioned the uh timing of you being elected so i'm sure there were a lot of a lot of hope but a lot of devastation <laughs> in your in your receiving this incredible platform what what was going through your mind at that time? Yeah, well, I had worked in government for about 10 years when I decided to run for office. And running for office was never something that was inherent to me. It mm -hmm. was nothing that I like, I was like, I want to get into politics because I want to run for office. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get into politics because I wanted to learn about policy making and about how to change policy in the background. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't feel comfortable with all the media and all the <laughs> attention and all, but eventually what i learned in doing this work is that if we put obstacles on ourselves mm -hmm. if we don't challenge the fear that we have mm -hmm. then we won't become the advocates that our communities may need at that time and at that time in my community the elected officials that had been in office had been trailblazers they had been the first of many things to be elected but they had been in office at this point for over 20 years collectively mm -hmm. And so here I was, a young woman working in government, and I decided that I wanted to put my hat in the ring for um, a political position, the assembly, for the first time. It was challenging. I was the underdog um, throughout the entire race. You know, many people said, it's your first time running. Everybody loses the first time. Um, that's one of the things that candidates really are, is a disheartening thing to hear. You know, people would say, well, it's great. You're going to get your name out there. You know, no one abandons their work, their life, and their family to get their name out there. Yeah. Most of us that run for office, right? We have some aspirational um, qualities about us. We want to change the world. We don't want to gain experience. Yeah. And so it's disheartening to hear. And I heard it often. I often heard that I was too young to hold elected office. I often heard that politics was not a place for a woman. Mm. And especially a woman with a young family. When I ran for office, my daughter was one and a half. Um, oftentimes when I was campaigning in the street, I, some men would say to me like, where's your husband? Why are you home cooking for him? Gross. Ridiculous Ugh. things that is like, what? Like, yeah, what year like, are you living in? Yeah, also you've had 10 years of experience at this point. What are exactly. you like, what? 
exactly but you know oftentimes our experience our our experiences are uh, diminished people mm -hmm. say oh you worked in politics but you were just a politician's assistant right it wasn't about giving credit for the laws that you've changed for the lives that you've helped you know alleviate and bring relief to in the community for the projects that you've led and so it was really about changing the narrative about that and really showing people that whatever box or category you want to put me in i'm going to show you exactly why i'm not the person you think i am mm. uh, and eventually after you know a year of campaigning uh, we were able to win the election and so and like i said it was the night that donald trump was elected president and I was supporting Hillary Clinton, just for mm. full disclosure. <laughs> and so I was heartbroken that night, but I was happy for the change that was coming to my own community, but I was heartbroken for what would have been the future of the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, a, it was a great lesson because it meant that the next day I had to get up and be like, all right, mm. we're getting to work. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we mobilize to make sure that our community knows the things that are coming down the pipe, our community is educated, our community is uh, willing to engage in a process where every single time that something happens in this administration, we're gonna call it out and we're gonna ask and demand change. Mm. Um, so it, it was looking back at it, a scary moment, but a moment that really helped me to find my voice. Yeah, you know, it's one of, it, it sounds like it, it put a little, um... Oh, I I was about to mush all of these different cliches out. I can't I can't even think of one. Fire under your seat. That's that's it's one, true, right? Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, so I noticed that you are passionate about providing mental health services for all New Yorkers. Why is that so important to you? Well, for many reasons. One being that as I was growing up in Washington Heights in Manhattan, in Upper Manhattan at the time when I grew up, there was um, a lot of young people that I had the privilege of really helping through my work with the youth groups in the community. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that often was at the center of like uh, fights or misunderstandings or altercations with their parents or other members of the community was the lack of having someone to talk to was the lack of having support, was the lack of having mediation done at, in the home where parents could have a conversation about the differences, um, the cultural differences, the generational differences. Um, and also at the center of that was also mental health, depression that takes over um, certain teens. Uh, I represent a community in Upper Manhattan that is home to the George Washington Bridge. And the George Washington Bridge has been a bridge where many people have taken their lives. Um, there was a New York Times article about how that bridge, uh, many people had jumped off the bridge. And so I wanted to make sure that in my community, we were having the conversation about depression. We were having the conversation about breaking the stigmas around depression, around mental illness. All of us have mental health, mental well-being. And just like you would go to a doctor for regular services when you're not feeling well, you have a sore throat, you also should look for professional help when you're feeling certain emotions that may lead to negative thoughts. And mm -hmm. so doing that work, I found out that Latina girls had uh, about a 25% of Latina girls ages nine to 14 in New York state have seriously considered suicide and some had planned their suicide. Those and so babies. for me, it's babies, that's a pandemic. And the numbers are even more startling when you look at African-American boys. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it was like I wanted to make an impact in a crisis that was taking so many young lives from our community, in my opinion, unnecessarily, because mm -hmm. there's so much help that's out there. There's so much work that we can do. And the main thing we kept running into was access. How do you give people access? Because if there, even if there's help available, but you can't afford it, yeah. right? Or if help is available, but it's not in your native language or in the native language of your parents, mm -hmm. how do you access that help? And so we began looking at legislative solutions. Um, in 2017, the governor of New York uh, signed legislation that I authored, creating the Suicide Prevention Task Force for New York 
And that task force is, um, their main responsibility is to look at what resources are available in different communities and make sure that those resources are culturally competent, take into consideration uh, the income levels of different communities, take into, consider into consideration marginalized communities. So are you a veteran of war and you're coming back into a community with PTSD? Or are you a member of the LGBT community and you need other services provided to you? What is, where are the people in our community and how do we gain access to quality um, mental health services? And so it's been a journey mm -hmm. to try and, and, and deal with this issue because it's a serious issue. It's a mm -hmm. heavy issue, yeah. uh, but also it's an issue that has, that combines social services and the need for resources. Mm -hmm. And so those are two very difficult things when it comes to the way government works. Yeah. Was that the first type of legislation that you had authored in that type of, of uh, tricky area? Yeah, that was actually my first, the first bill as an assemblywoman oh. that the governor of New York signed. So it was one of my first pieces of legislation that I authored and he signed. Um, and so, yes, it was definitely something that, you know, I think started a conversation since then. We've made very strong partnerships with organizations that are doing the work on the ground and supporting those organizations so that they can come. In my community, they built a, it's called Life is Precious. Mm -hmm. So they built a center uh, to make sure that any girls who are experiencing uh, any thoughts are able to have an outlet. They do art, they do art therapy, music therapy. Um, and it's just a, a fabulous and beautiful space for our girls to go and learn how to be confident about who they are. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. I, I bet that feels so good to be like, yes, what I'm doing, I made the right choice. I'm in the right place. I'm making a difference. That's amazing. I love that. Yes, and speaking of, speaking of making a difference, <laughs> tell us about the green light bill. Yeah, so the green light bill was something that um, had been in the works in New York State for a long time. And the Green Light Bill basically allows for anyone in New York State who's able to pass a written exam and a practical exam to get their driver's license. Why is this an issue in New York? Because if you were undocumented or an undocumented person, you are, you are not able to have a driver's license. I visited um, correctional facilities, detention centers, where people had been arrested for driving without a license. For many undocumented people, if you're arrested while driving without a license or if you're arrested for a DWI or any traffic infraction, even running a red light or going through a stop sign, these are all serious offenses. But for a person who is undocumented, that is an immediate cause for deportation. Mm -hmm. And so at a time where we were fighting uh, to keep families united, uh, it was important for us to guarantee uh, the ability for people to drive. If you are someone who has to go through an exam, if you are someone who has to pass a driver's license, you're going to be a safer driver yeah. and you're not going to get into a DWI and you're not going to run a red light because you've already taken all the practical courses in order to get that license. Before this bill passed, people were driving because in some areas of our communities that are transit deserts, you can't get to work without driving. Yeah. Um, and so they were driving and putting their lives at risk and the community at risk. Um, and so we helped pass legislation to make sure that everyone in New York State would be able to have access to a driver's license. It's been life changing for many um, immigrants who rely on their cars in order to get to work, to get their children to school. But we've even heard horror stories of people not having a driver's license and having someone get sick in their home and not be able to get their son or daughter to the hospital. Uh, right. And so when you think some of us, we take these privileges for granted. We think about it as, you know, what do you need a driver's license for? You know, I'm a city girl. So I got my driver's license the year I was elected into office. Before that, <laughs> I took the train everywhere. Um, and so, you know, we, those are privileges that we take for granted because we've never had anyone say you can't do it. But the moment that someone says you can't do X, you can't do Y, you can't do Z because of where you come from, uh, it creates an underclass of citizens who are not able to be independent. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe in an underclass of citizens. I believe that we're all here and we all have a purpose 
and we all have a reason to contribute to our communities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, that's very interesting. I had never really considered the inability to even just get a driver's license. That's just not, you know, I, I'm from Texas, so I had to get a, a driver's license when I turned 16 because you can't literally go outside anyway. of your neighborhood <laughs> without a license or a car. But um, as soon as I moved to New York, I, I think I've driven maybe three times. And yeah, that's never exactly. when I'm here. It's always somewhere else. But you know, when you do consider like the further parts, even in Astoria, there's like places that the buses don't even go and you gotta like walk 10, 15 blocks to get to the bus to take you 30 blocks to the train to take you. And that's just, you can't, Absolutely. that's not feasible to function in the way that you need to add, especially with like a sick person in your home. Like you just can't, that's crazy. Exactly. And now we're in a global pandemic, right? And you think about, you know, mass transit and, and the hours of operation and all that. And I'm always someone that I encourage everyone who can to use mass transit, right? Because I believe that in order to help the earth, we have to mm. not rely so much on cars. But the reality is that if for some of our live livelihood, for some of the things that we need to do on a daily basis, it's just not feasible. Right. It's just not. Yeah. Well, is there something you've been able to accomplish in your time as Assemblywoman that you are particularly proud of, excluding our previous two topics? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that I'll tell you two things that I'm proud of. Yeah. The first thing is going from being an underdog, where no one thought that I would actually win a race, to then seeing a number, a record number of women run for office and win in New York State and throughout the country, it really makes me feel like I'm part of something. Yes. It makes me feel like I'm part of a movement to show that compassionate leadership and the, and the capacity that women bring as leaders is something that should not be overlooked and should not be a second thought. So I'm proud of myself for facing that fear and actually taking that leap um, and also, I'm proud that I am now in an institution where I can hold a door open and say, we need more of you to come in. Come on in. Come on in. We need more women. Mm. So I'm super proud of that. In addition to that, I think, like I mentioned earlier, I feel like I found my voice doing this work of advocating for my community mm. and especially the immigrant community, mm. which is something that I, I identify with so personally. Uh, one of the things that we were able to do last year was to pass the New York State Dream Act, which was a bill that I also was the main sponsor for and gave educational access to undocumented immigrants in New York. Um, and so that means that everyone, no matter what their immigration status is, can access higher education. And I think that education for me is the only thing that has broken the cycle of poverty in my own family and in my own community. And so allowing people to have sort of the tools to break themselves out of, you know, being codependent on and being, and being poor really uh, is something that I'm super proud of. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I love to hear that you, you're saying you, you are here opening the door saying, come on in, bring more, just because I feel like in the past, I've, uh, I've had this conversation a few times, but it's, it's like, when you look at the past or the way things are depicted in like movies or whatever with women in power, they always make it look like there's only room for one woman in the room. And then yes. you have to fight your way and smash down anyone else to get there. And exactly. that's just, that's just that's untrue. Not true. <laughs> it's just untrue. not. Absolutely. And there's also, isn't a mold of what you're supposed to look like right? Like I walk around and people say, you don't look like an assembly woman. And I say, what is an assembly woman supposed to look like? You know? Um, what, like tight bun? Like what? I what don't know. You know, <laughs> assembly woman can't smile. She can't be nice. She can't, you know, represent her community authentically. Like, so also it's breaking the stereotypes about what women in leadership positions are supposed to be, what they're supposed to look like, what mm -hmm. their experiences are supposed to be. And I think now in politics, we're seeing that. Right, we're actually seeing a moment 
where people who don't, who are not your usual or typical people that you're used to seeing are actually breaking the molds and becoming the leaders that the communities need, which is what we should be looking for. Absolutely. And I feel like another major thing is, is representation matters. And when you see, um, like when a, when a, Latino girl sees this like Latina New York assembly woman, she's like, oh, oh, and there could be just like lights going off. Being like, it doesn't have to just be these specific old white man or like, like stuffy, crazy lady with those scary little (laughs) spectacles, right? Like that's what I picture. (laughs) Yeah, like I, I always tell the story of my daughter she, um, you know, I, I ran for office when she was one years old and she came back from kindergarten one day. She's like, mommy, do you know that so-and-so's mother doesn't have a campaign office? <laughs> and I was like, I believe you. And she was like, everyone's mother should have a campaign office. And I was like, you're absolutely right. And so we're also <laughs> constructing a universe for our children where yeah. they think that this is normal mm-hmm. and they normalize the achievement of women and they normalize yes. what their like what their ceiling is and what and what and is limitless right mm. and so i think that that's important for future generations right Absolutely. that is not daddy that's going to run for office it's mm-hmm. mommy you yeah. know yeah Absolutely. That's so, I love that you said that that's hysterical, but <laughs> kids, kids do that stuff all the time. It's so funny. My, my mom's a pianist. And so I grew up with her just like playing like nobody's business. And I would go to friends' houses. I'm like, where's your piano? Like, why don't you all play the piano? And everyone's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness. That's adorable. What is next for you? Sure. So I'm actually going to be running for the city council. So I'm going from the state office to wanting to represent my community at city hall. Um, and so that's next. I've been an assembly woman now for four years. Um, I'm looking to represent my own community, the same community that I've represented in the, in the assembly at the city council. Um, in 2021, New York City is going to get a new mayor. We're going to have a new comptroller. We're going to have an entirely new city council. And I'm looking forward to e- have an even deeper impact on what's happening locally. And the best way to do that is to run for office locally mm. um, and have that impact. And so I'm looking forward to that. Um, the campaign is kicking off soon. And so it's going to be an exciting opportunity. And I'm looking forward to it. When um, When is that uh election uh june 2021 is the election um we've already kicked off because we've started um you know our fundraising and we've declared the campaign uh with the city we've Mm -hmm. registered the campaign with the city um but the official uh work of the campaign will start in the next month or so Mm. okay awesome Awesome. Yeah. Love that. Oh, look out, Carmen 2021. Oh. <laughs> oh, we're gonna plug it. Don't even worry. <laughs> oh my goodness. So have you had any setbacks that have made you question yourself and your decisions? Yeah, um, same thing for me. You know, it's hard to have the professional and personal life balance. Um, I've mentioned my daughter a few times. I obviously have a young family. My job takes me to Albany um, four days a week. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's been a difficult uh, journey as far as feeling. And this is mostly a selfish feeling, right? Because it's like you want to be all things to all people. And you Mm -hmm. can't because there's only one of you. So I've definitely had moments where I've I've questioned um, my future because I've said, you know, what will it look like when my daughter's a teenager and I'm not able to be there for her um, in moments where she, I need to be there for her, right? Um, and so there have definitely been setbacks. You know, most recently I've been dealing with my husband who's had a health condition um, and it's been a difficult journey to try to find that balance. But he has said something to me that, that makes sense. And I think ultimately this is where we need to go as women is that they're happy when I'm happy Mm -hmm. and I'm happiest and most fulfilled when I'm in my community 
doing the things that are in my heart. And so, uh, although I've seen and I've had moments where I question, like, is this really what the future is for me? Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, my happiness comes when I can make other people happy, when I can help, when I can have my voice inserted into a process that's going to empower the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And they found happiness in, in those moments. But it's been tough. It's, there's moments where you really do question, especially when you know there's tough votes coming up or there's decisions that you're um, not sure about how it will impact your community. Mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely moments of wondering and saying, you know, what would it have been if I would have chose a different path. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard, but I think that overall, I wake up every morning and I'm happy and I feel that I'm living in my purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know that I've made the right choices eventually. We all have bad days. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do, you, how do you trust your gut so much? How do, you, how do you get up in the morning, even when you've had a really tough day and just say, you know what? it's fine. Yesterday is yesterday. Today's going to be today. These things are going to happen. Do you turn to your, to your family, your, your colleagues, yeah. yourself? <laughs> I turn to friends that are in politics. I also turn um, inward and try to decipher what are the things that are making me feel negative mm -hmm. and try to eliminate those things from my existence. Like sometimes there's days that I need to delete social media from my phone. Mm -hmm. because there's just you know a thread about all the things you're doing wrong and you're just like i i can't i can't i can't deal with it today yeah so i'm yeah. gonna delete you facebook for the week mm -hmm. and i'll download you again when i'm ready mm -hmm. right um or there's having conversations with an inner circle that you can vent to about the the situations that are difficult mm -hmm. i think overall when we deal with the things that come to us we deal with them subconsciously so we kind of move, we just keep moving. You don't let it like deter you to the point where you can't get out of bed. You move. And I find that sometimes I'm home and I'm overthinking things. The pandemic did this to me almost every other day yeah. where I was like, how are we ever going to be COVID? I can't possibly feed all these people. I can't possibly, you know, get testing sites in every corner of my district. Like, what are we going to do? I, I'm, I give up. I'm done. And then I'll like walk to my office. And as I'm walking to my office, I'll bump into a neighbor and the person will be like, thank you so much for being here and, and listening. And, and then you're like, all right, all right, all right. I could do this, I could do this. <laughs> and you just keep going. And then you find like, like affirmations for why you're doing this work mm. and it makes it worth it. Mm -hmm. So you it's know, not being yeah. deterred by your negative thoughts. Yeah. Kind of working through them. And also, yeah, like you said, kind of finding where these negative thoughts are coming from, because most of the time they're not valid, you know, <laughs> like, it's yeah, just, we give them power over our being and we shouldn't. Yeah. For, for no explicable reason, you know, it's probably random previous traumas that kind of exactly. surface and you're like, oh, that one time in third grade when that didn't work out, that's affecting exactly. me today. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. What has been your experience as a woman of color in New York politics? Well, my experience as a woman of color, there's a lot of things because I don't only identify as a woman. I identify as a Latina. I, ident I identify as someone who has African roots. I identify as a mother. I identify as a daughter, right? And so being a woman of color, and being young mm. is different than being a woman of color and being middle-aged, right? right? There's different expectations set upon you. There's different assumptions made. Um, I also represent a community that's not well off, right? So I'm not coming into the legislature with wealthy constituents, right? I'm coming into the legislature to represent the poorest New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's been about working to break sort of the stereotype mm -hmm. of what a woman of color is, is expected to be and showing them what a woman of color truly is, right? Um, having the ability to bring people together, having mm -hmm. the ability to build coalitions and lead on issues that normally people think you shouldn't lead on, right? 
Right. What is a woman who represents a poor community and, you know, came to this country as an immigrant talking about taxing multi-billionaires? What right do you have to tax multi-billionaires? Well, that's an issue that I'm talking about and that's an issue that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. And so kind of just being able to build and consolidate new ideas, um, it's important for me. Mm -hmm. And I also think that understanding that we as women and as women as a woman of color are in these positions for a moment and in those moments we have to lead in confidence and then also ensure that we're leaving a, a path for the women that are to follow mm -hmm. um i lean heavily on women that are in the legislature now i have several other women who have been instrumental in my growth who have shown me that were on my ways in moments where I'm too, uh, you know, too much of a naive, too naive, or I'm too eager to mm. get something done, and that's not the way that it works, right? Mm. Um, and then there's women that encourage when I'm rebellious and and I'm uh, looking to do something with such a passion. They encourage the passion. Mm -hmm. So it's about you know surrounding yourself with other women who have been in positions where you are, mm. and ultimately leaving a legacy mm -hmm. for the generation that's to come. That's how I see it. Right. You know, that, that is a, I have to formulate some thoughts because I had so many, so many thoughts. <laughs> I, I think that that type of approach, that type of thought process is the exact type that needs to be in a position of leadership does that make sense i feel like yeah. you are just that sort of approach and and i can say that the listeners can't see you but i can see you and it's very um you have a light air about you even mm -hmm. while you're so passionate and discussing all of these because it's a very it's 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 endearing and also makes me want to listen and do everything that you're saying <laughs> does that oh, make sense thank you. <laughs> like your 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 approach and your um ability to express all of these emotions and thoughts that you have had throughout your experience is really um admirable well, As I fumble through all my words. <laughs> I appreciate that. that. It's important, you know. Thank you. Is there someone that always inspires you? Um, you know, I draw a lot of inspiration from people in my community, mm -hmm. right? Like, for example, I'll give you an example. There, there could be someone who is in the middle of an eviction and is going through everything in life that could go wrong went wrong but yet they're still kind, right? So I draw a lot of inspiration from people who are um, in this moment are still hopeful and still working. I think that if there was a presence of a specific person that I constantly draw inspiration from, it's my mother. Um, she 100% um, is someone who has always taught me to be a better version of myself. Um, she's someone that came to this country as an immigrant, obviously, but did not speak English and did, and only was able to get to um, her uh, sophomore year in high school back in, in our native country, came to this country, was a home health aide, working with um, older individuals, taking care of older individuals. And she did that for 25 years, still managing to be a present and thoughtful parent and never allowing us to see the things that were hard for her. Um, she always did it with a smile. When she had to be tough, she was. I'm still afraid of her and she's <laughs> five feet tall. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, she's someone who definitely, when I think about the type of woman I want to aspire to be, I think of her. And you know, mm -hmm. I'm adopted. So for me, it, there's an added knowledge of knowing that you know, she did everything she did for me without having to, you know, yeah. she specifically uh, is, is for me an angel that was put in my path. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I really love her. She's amazing. Uh, she helps me so much still. 
uh, to try to balance everything that's happening. And so she's someone that I always look towards. But I think I, I draw so much inspiration from people who have just defied the odds. Mm -hmm. And she's one of them. Mm -hmm. Is she uh, is she able to be around your your daughter and the family a lot? Yes, yes, she definitely helps me every day. She actually has my daughter right now, um, and she's you know she has she's a ball of energy. I'm like, <laughs> when are you ever going to like go sit on a beach somewhere? She's like, no, you know, <laughs> she's, she's like, happy I'm just being active. It. <laughs> yeah, she's fine. Uh, so yeah, she's definitely a big part of how I'm able to be successful today still because she's helpful. I love that. What's the yeah. best piece of advice that you've ever received? So the best piece of advice that I think I've ever received to this point, at least, is um, when faced with a tough vote, someone told me there are core values that you hold dear to your heart that no one can move you on. You need to identify what those core values are and then everything else is a negotiable. Mm. And when you think of things that simply and you have a very tough decision to make, if you know that it goes against your value of being an honest person, your value of you know being kind, your value of being someone who puts out good energy into the world, if it compromises your value, then the answer is no. And the mm. answer is always no no matter what or who is in front of you or who is telling you that you need to do X, Y, and Z. If it compromises who you are, the answer is no. Mm. And I think that's something that has helped me in moments of difficulty. And so, you know, and it's also helped me to also get a grip because sometimes I take things a little too seriously all the time. And I'm like, I can't possibly, you know, do that because that goes against who I am. And then it's like, does it really? You know, like mm. it, it makes me analyze and second guess. And sometimes... Things that I usually say no to because of X, Y, and Z reason could be turned into a yes. So it works both ways. Mm, interesting. Have you found yeah. that that piece of advice transfers to other parts of your life as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the major things um, that affects and impacts what we do is who we surround ourselves with. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing, right? If people do not match your social, your, your, um, sort of your, your core values, mm -hmm. then they're not going to add anything positive mm -hmm. to your life. So let it go. And you know, you'll be blessed with other people that will match. Yeah. yeah you are who you spend time with, Absolutely. you know, and it's, that's, you know, if you're not spending time with the people that are going to help build you up, why are you spending time with them? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great piece of advice. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, before we get to our last two questions, is there anything else that you would like to add? Anything we didn't touch on? How we can keep up with you and what you're doing? Anything mm -hmm. like that? Well, I'm on social media. So I encourage all of you to follow me at CN De La Rosa. So C-N-D-E-L-A-R-O-S-A. Um, that's my Twitter handle and my Instagram handle and my Facebook. So just find me there, follow me, um, and let's continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. All right. So I ask the last same two questions to everyone that comes through the podcast. First, what is your second favorite color? That, you know, that was a tough question. <laughs> my, my second favorite color, I would have to say, is black. Hmm. Why? Because I feel that black is elegant. Every time I wear black, I feel like a powerhouse, right? Mm -hmm. I love black. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first favorite color is actually gray, which is a mixture of black and white. Mm -hmm. um, but I really like those type of like neutral tones. And I feel like black for me just signifies power. And mm -hmm. I like that. And so some, I, I, I really like it. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> And lastly, what, in your opinion, is the best part of being a woman? I thought about this. Um, there's a lot of good things about being a woman. I think that the most important thing, though, for me, mm -hmm. is being able to prove people wrong, right? It's kind of like when people have an expectation of mm -hmm. what you are, who you are, based on the mere fact that you're a woman. 
and you're able to turn around and be like, let me surprise you every single time. Um, I like that. I, mm-hmm. I think I like being the underdog, I think is really what it is. Um, and I think that there is something so uniquely powerful about women and how we demonstrate that power um, that I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. It's so, it's so true. It's always, it always feels kind of good when you're like, oh, oh, you, you said I couldn't do this, but uh, take a look. Cause exactly. I did. <laughs> exactly. And I feel like it always comes out in not a, um, uh, not necessarily a like, I'm going to beat you down because I am here. Like it's a, no, no, no. you just miss that person for a while. And then once you do what they said you couldn't, you're like, hey, remember, remember yeah. when, and now look, and here we are. <laughs> and I've often found that I don't even have to do that part. It's like they realize on their own, like, oh, I see what you did there. You know, I see that. And then I'm like, oh, did you? Oh, I wasn't even thinking about what you said, <laughs> you know? Um, but it's, 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 I love being a woman. I think that I've enjoyed my womanhood in the eyes of my daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, she's now growing up to be, and I'm like, if I'm Spitfire, the world has got it. They better watch out. Cause my oh, daughter my is God. just, she's six. She's sassy. She's smart. She's independent and she doesn't take anything from anyone. And I'm just like, wow, <laughs> like, this is what it's like when they say raise strong daughters. She's just, I don't even know where she gets it from. I'm like, <laughs> um, what do you mean? You don't know where she gets it from? Literally you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess. And also your mom. She's got yeah. these two That's really true. strong, independent women who are yeah. like, yeah, mom has a campaign office. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, that's where she gets it. <laughs> Give yourself more credit. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. I loved every minute of talking with you and like I said a little bit earlier you are exactly the kind of person to be in this type of position um I cannot wait to see where this all leads for you because it's going to be amazing and I'm in New York so so I'm gonna keep track (laughs) well thank you so much and also thank you for the platform I think it's important to tell our stories as women and encourage other other women and other men too, because men listen, right? Mm -hmm. And they learn as well. So I appreciate you allowing me to have this platform and share it with you. Oh, thank you. I did it. I'm going to do a little hair toss. (laughs) And thank you listeners for tuning in again. Subscribe, rate, and review. You know the drill on that. It helps the podcast grow and grow so that more and more people can hear from these incredible women every week. If you want some extra inspiration, you can follow our social medias, Instagram at Women of Her Story Podcast, Twitter at The Her Story Pod, visit our website at ofherstory.com or send us an email to womenofherstorypodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, be safe, stay healthy, and show the world what you're made of. This is a New York Glitch production. You are the worst. (laughs)